It is reported that over 9 million people living in the U.S. are on weight loss drugs, a 300 percent uptick from 2020 to last year. We're also hearing from celebrities like Oprah and Elon Musk who have talked about their own experiences. Hailed as the wonder weight loss drug, Ozempic, once given exclusively to patients with type 2 diabetes, has become the latest go-to solution for shedding pounds and shedding pounds fast. Other weight loss drugs like Wagovi and Manjaro are gaining traction too. And if you haven't taken any of these yourself, you probably know someone who has. People all across the country have been posting their own personal experiences with these injectable weight loss medications to social media. I have been on compounded semaglutide for over 18 months and I have lost over 100 pounds. Goodbye obesity. My last check-in, I was 194 pounds and this week I am 191. Are these miracle drugs really accessible to all Americans who need them? And how well do they work? We're tapping into the pulse of the people now. Here with what you need to know is Dr. Melanie J, director of NYU Langone's comprehensive program on obesity research. Dr. J, first off, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation. Yeah, well, we are too. And you know, just to kick this off, can you talk about the variety of weight loss drugs we hear a lot about Ozempic, but is that, that seems to be the only one of many brands. Absolutely. So I'll talk about two ones, two major classes of medication in particular. Both of them are weekly injectables. So we have semaglutide and semaglutide is FDA approved for both diabetes and obesity. For diabetes, it's called Ozempic, which is the mm. one you hear about. And for obesity, it's marketed as Wagovi. They are actually the same compound. They are both GLP-1 receptor agonists and they work at the level of both the brain and the gut to reduce appetite intake and food. And those classes of medications when used for obesity lead to around a 15% weight loss. There's a newer medication called terzepatide. This is called Munjaro for diabetes and Zetbound for obesity. And this one has the same GLP receptor one agonist that's in semaglutide, but it has another component called GIP. And it also works at the level of the brain and the gut, but it um, it has a little more weight loss potentially of around 20% of total weight. And there are a lot of other injectable medications that are going to be coming down the pipeline and some oral medications. And so we are really in a kind of a renaissance period with more choices than ever for delivering effective medication-based treatment for obesity. Yeah, and it's interesting to see the differences between diabetes and weight loss and how those drugs essentially work. But you say the increase in use of weight loss drugs is actually a good thing in relation to the increasing rate of obesity in the U.S. Tell us more about what you mean. Yeah, so right now our best stats say, which are probably outdated, that about 42% of American adults have obesity. And it's slated to increase to about 50% by 2030. In the past few years, what I've been told or learned or read is that only one to 3% of eligible people receive obesity medications. So if it goes up 300%, that means now say maybe three to 9%, although that still says, seems high to me, people who are eligible getting the medication. So it's still a largely undertreated disease. When it comes to Ozempic specifically being introduced to treat type 2 diabetes, can you address the idea that its use for weight loss could be taking away from diabetes patients? Yeah, well, Ozempic is FDA approved for diabetes and Wagovi, which is the same medicines, FDA approved for diet for obesity, but people try to get their hands on because access is a problem to whichever ones they can get. Um, I've heard a lot in the media that, oh, well, if you give the medication for obesity, you're taking it away for people from diabetes who need it. And I take issue with that because it implies that people with diabetes are somehow more deserving of this scarce resource than people with obesity. Um, both are serious conditions. Actually, obesity puts someone at much higher risk for diabetes. Mm. And, um, and there are actually a lot of FDA-approved medications for diabetes that are covered by insurance at this point, whereas with obesity, we do not have as many choices, and especially ones that um, 
uh, are covered by insurance so that people can get. So I take issue with one being more important than the other. Like if there are effective treatments, we have to figure out a way to get them to the people who need them the most. Both very serious diseases and uh, two that are very much interconnected. Um, let's talk about access. How big of an issue is access for most Americans when it comes to cost and health care coverage? Yeah, it is a really big issue. I mean, right now, Medicare does not cover obesity medications. In most states, Medicaid does not cover these medications. And for private insurance, it, it is really insurance dependent. And then on top of the cost and the access, because if you pay out of pocket, it's, you know, $900 to $1,300 a month, which most people can't afford. And uh, this can cause a lot of problems. It can cause problems, one, with people getting it from dangerous sources. So we hear about people getting from compounding pharmacies. We now hear about counterfeit uh, drugs. And so this could have safety issues and quality issues. Um, there is the problem of not having necessarily adequate follow-up, and we'll talk about side effects, I'm sure, in the future and, and maybe some of the adverse events, but if you're not followed by a physician or a healthcare provider who really knows how to monitor you, then that could be a problem. And then the third thing, problem with access is around health disparities. So who are the people who are able to afford these medications? And just because uh, you are from a vulnerable population or happen to be poor, doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to have the same access to effective treatment. So the access issues are really problematic. Yeah, and within the last six months alone, I hear, like, I see so many ads, uh, you know, for Ozempic, Manjaro, Wagovi, and so many people are talking about it. It's become such a you know, big part of, you know, culture here in the U.S. So with such a big demand, how big is the concern for counterfeit versions of these drugs? Um, I don't know how common it is or not for counterfeit. I do have seen, and I, and I haven't seen it, but of course, how would I know necessarily? Mm -hmm. But compounding, I do have a lot of patients who are going to compounding pharmacies. And the Obesity Society just came out with a uh, position statement saying that this is could be very problematic and because there's not the same level of quality control. And so either they might not be effective or they could have impurities or they're different formulations. So uh, I would I would be careful with that. Yeah. Very interesting. And we heard from one woman, Jessica, who wrote to us about her side effects, nausea, headaches, exhaustion, hair loss, and depression. Walk us through some of these complications some patients report seeing. Yeah. So there are side effects and then there are kind of adverse events or ad really dangerous things that can happen but are very rare. The side effects are not rare. So especially when people are starting somewhere between 25 to 40% of people will have nausea, will have diarrhea, constipation, mm. about 10% might have abdominal pain, and this is according to the, the clinical trials. A lot of these kind of more minor GI symptoms, as you titrate, as people get used to it, they get better and they get more tolerable. So a lot of those will go away, although a bunch of patients just decide they can't tolerate it or it's so severe. A lot of them can be managed by, you know, learning dietary changes on um, smaller meals, not fatty foods, not spicy foods. And so we can work with people around most of those side effects. There Doctor are some serious mm -hmm. side effects or adverse events uh, that we have to be careful of. Whenever there's rapid weight loss, gallstones can be mm. a problem. And that's a surgical, that's something that has to be dealt with surgically. And so knowing when the abdominal pain is something where you should go to the emergency room is really important to have someone you can ask or, or talk to. Um, pancreatitis is very, very rare, and that's a serious mm. side effect, which is inflammation of the pancreas. Um, there's, you know, it, it slows down the gut. These medications slow down the gut, so there could be some, like, almost paralysis of the gut that can happen, although that is very, very rare as well. Um, but when you have millions of people taking medication, you're going to see some of these very rare side effects. And so making sure any medications are risk benefit. So taking the medication to lose 10 pounds, it's probably there's other ways you can lose the 10 pounds with that are, that are safer. When someone has a serious chronic disease that's not adequately treated and they've not been able to control it via lifestyle alone, then that risk benefit a calculation a lot of times does favor the medication. 
Dr. Terry Debro, star of ETV's botched show, recently opened up about his own experience taking Ozempic. He told Page Six he quit taking it after losing the joy of eating. Uh, how much influence do celebrities, and in this case, celebrity doctors, have on the average person's perception of these drugs? Yeah. I can't answer how that affects people's perceptions, but he is not the ideal candidate for this drug. He mm. just needed to lose 10 or 15 pounds. So of course, losing the joy of food might not be worth it for that person. I, that's not been a complaint that I've been hearing a lot. I've never had a person who's losing weight on the medication as, and is being effective for that person say that they wanna go off it because they've lost the joy to eat. Usually what they're saying is they've lost their obsession with food. And um, and so I really haven't uh, I really haven't heard that. I can imagine that being true, but it's not been much of an issue. And I've had people who say that some of the appetite benefits, I mean, decreases in their appetite over time, like their appetite does come back, even though they're still able to keep the weight off. So, uh, but they're still eating less, but they're, I haven't really heard that as much, but he's not the ideal candidate for the medication. And I worry that people will think, oh, well, he took the medication to lose 10 to 15 pounds. So that's something I can do. Yeah, and there's so much information we're seeing in the media, whether it's, you know, the entertainment media, the news media, when you turn on your television and see these ads, it's really hard for, I think, a lot of consumers and Americans to break this all down and understand it. But that's why we have you, Dr. J. Thank you so much for taking a few moments out of your day to explain this to us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for What's America Thinking. Come back next week. I'm Julia Manchester. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hills YouTube channel.